We are currently tonight in session two of six, and we'll be talking a little bit about religion and family structure. You can see here statistically, these are recent statistics. 48% of the country identifies as Protestant, or they would say evangelico. 41% um, of the country identifies as Roman Catholic or Catolico. Um, and only about 11% of the, the country identifies as either some other language or atheist or non-religious. Um, and so you can see based on these numbers that um, definitely in Honduras, and in Honduras, there is a strong culture of Christianity that's really significant, both in the urban areas and in a lot of the rural communities. Right. It was 1502 when it was first, um, when colonialism and Catholicism presented, um, and then Protestantism kind of paralleled that. Then we started to see um, more of independence and mainland missions. And then as we've continued, it's now that we're starting to see more indigenous leadership, um, even within the church and in various different ways in, um, in different practices that we're seeing religiously throughout Honduras. And so what we see in the text is that Elvia and Alvarado and other women within the church organized groups where they actually are really practical in the way that they're thinking about entering into communities and creating change based on things that they they see as centered around the gospel and the message and the ministry um, of Jesus. She also additionally talks about this divide between kind of what she saw within the, the some of the priests in the Catholic church and then what she was seeing within the communities um, which, you know, is not always true, um, but I think there's often kind of this sense within um, rural communities where maybe they see this disconnect that she talks about, but not all priests read the Bible the same way. There are priests who have had it easy all their lives. They're from rich families. Their parents paid for their education. A lot of those priests don't give a hoot about the poor. And as she talks about that, um, she also kind of emphasizes um, what it meant for her to be able to connect more deeply with an authentic spirituality that actually did show a deep care for the poor. Um, she also talks a lot in the text about the way that, that many rural communities don't have pastors or priests that are able to come out to those areas. In fact, a lot of the priests will stay more in the urban areas, and there are practical reasons around that economically. Maybe rural areas are not able to support priests or pastors in their churches. And so there are lay people who will lead the churches, um, but that can be really challenging in terms of really having kind of authentic um, faith teaching that is coming from a place where they actually have a background in education. The Leadership Center, um, we're really passionate about being able to create opportunities for spiritual formation and discipleship that will empower the women who are there to really be biblically literate and have and then talking a little bit about family structure in Honduras, there's a huge emphasis in Honduras on family loyalty. People are so passionate about creating spaces of family that maybe even look different. They're also very protective of young girls in a variety of ways. Girls are considered vulnerable and at risk for early pregnancy. There's also a lot of awareness about safety issues in certain parts of the country. Right. Imagine the impact over time um, for a young woman who really doesn't feel like she has the safety to be able to even have the independence to go outside of her own home on her on her own. It's very different than I know what my life was like growing up. There are multiple types of marriage in Honduras, and actually most people in Honduras, even who are married um, or who consider themselves married, never go through a wedding. They don't necessarily wear rings. Um, they're kind of just considered married once they live together. Mm -hmm. Families are, are often much more stable in rural areas than they are in urban areas. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to talk a little bit more tonight also about this idea of machismo culture, um, which is really just another way of talking about a heavily patriarchal society, which is kind of this stronger aggressive masculine pride that often also creates a power dynamic um, both when it comes to family systems and family structure, but also when it comes to kind of the bigger picture social and political structures, and that really impacts women. As we mentioned before, there's a lot of information around adolescent birth rate in um, Central America and in Honduras. When women are able to get a higher level of education before they start their families, it makes a huge impact on their entire future career and also on their children and the level of education that their children will have and the opportunities that are available to children. When, when Elvia Alvarado talks about, um, she talks about marriage and she talks about machismo, um, 
she talks a lot about that role of men versus women and this double standard. For many men in the communities, there isn't an expectation that they'll be faithful to their wives. In fact, um, I saw this a lot when I was living in, in Cofredia, that men would start families with multiple different wives and sometimes keep one family hidden from the other family. Um, whereas if a woman were to be unfaithful in her marriage, it's a huge scandal. Uh, there's a lot of social shaming that goes along with that. She also yeah. talks a lot about family planning. Um, and she talks about uh, money from the United States, resources from the United States being sent in terms of birth control, but often not being sent in terms of education around birth control. And so even though maybe people then have access to birth control, they don't necessarily have an understanding of STDs or of different infections that can, that can go around even if people are using birth control. She also talks a lot about this idea of how hard women work, getting up before for the men early, early in the morning, they wake up before the light has even come to grind the corn, make tortillas, coffee for breakfast, and then work all day long. She also talks about, and I love the section of the book, prior to this part, she talks a little bit about violence, domestic violence within the home and how normalized it is, which is horrendous. It's hard to read about that. Um, it's hard to talk about it. Um, but I think the hope that she leaves us with, and I think this is profound, I've seen what happens when campesinos organize and have a plot of land to farm. They don't have time for drinking anymore, except on special occasions. They spend the day in the hot sun working. Most of them are very dedicated to their work and their families. So I've noticed, I love this line. I've noticed that once the campesinos have a purpose, once they have a way to make a living and take care of their families, they drink less and they usually stop beating their wives too. And I've seen that once the women get organized, they start to get their husbands in line. We feel super grateful um, to watch the women that we're partnering with making shifts in these ways that then will lift up their communities and start to create long-term change. Yeah. We are so excited that Lenise is here with us tonight to be able to share. She, first of all, graduated from TLC in our fourth cohort. She then almost immediately after that started her own business. She was a business entrepreneur in her community. She started a clothing business. Um, and then shortly after that, she actually ended up going to university and she's now almost finishing her bachelor's degree in psychology. Lenise, can you start off just by sharing um, with the audience here a little bit about your home life, what it was like for you um, in your community um, and in your family before you came to TLC? Yes, um, I'm the second oldest. In my family, we are seven. Uh, the first two um, our sisters, you know, we are girls, the two first children my parents had. I think this is, this is something that has also to do with the machismo culture and all of that situation, how it, it starts in the family. Because when there is a big brother, He's, suppo he's supposed to have the control in the family. You know? Will you share with us a little bit too about the powerful perspective that your dad had um, around education? I, I am truly a lucky girl and my sisters. We are lucky to have a dad that believes in us, that supports us. Yeah, he was the one who had the well-defined in like first, what we what he wanted us to have in the future and he asked us do you want to study you know that um so he said i am i want to support you but and i want you to have a different future so when so you I, say i mean you just touched on this a little bit would you say that your dad's beliefs about education were pretty different than what you saw for a lot of other families in the community How did yes you it was dif very different even my dad was criticized even at church, yeah, for making that decision. But even my grandpa didn't want me to go to TLC when we first heard of that. Do you know, have you ever had a conversation with your dad to know what it is that caused him to, to think so differently when, I mean, he was criticized for it, not even his dad felt the same way, his neighbors and community members didn't. Do you know what it was that caused your dad to feel so passionate about you and your sisters receiving an education? Yes, uh, we've talked about this and he says that he saw us working very hard to go to school. And uh, I mean, I did enjoy it a lot going to school. And uh, if we had to work 
in the house or work outside of the house. We did it. And he said that he saw something in us that, yeah, he believed in us. So we- That is so powerful. I just am feeling so grateful um, for whatever it was that inspired your dad to really think differently. Will you talk to us a little bit more about the ways that machisto culture affects um, Honduran women even right now? You were- for myself, it does affect it most with uh, men outside of the house because my dad is not a machista thanks mm-hmm. god yeah he's a christian man and i think it does make a difference in the life of men outside yes we are not supposed to go in the city at night i was sharing before that i didn't go to church for a long time because i lived in the city i had to take a taxi to go to church and I didn't feel safe. Men do, yeah, disrespectful things almost all the time. And sometimes even threatening. Yes, machismo is everywhere. Mm-hmm. And um, I think I'm a lucky one that doesn't get to live around it too much as yeah, many other women do. I'm staying now with a lady who is pregnant. And the man she lived with left her because she is going to have a boy. And he said that, oh, no, I'm, go- I'm leaving you because you're going to have a boy and boys don't help men. So you are going to stay with him. You're going to raise him because he's going to serve you. Thank you for sharing those things. I mean, I think you have helped us really to have a little bit more of a lens into what this looks like right now. Um, this is actually just to to bring us back to that idea of the impact and outcome of Leadership Mission International. So tonight we've talked a lot about religion and family structure. We've talked a little bit about machista culture um, and the impact that that has on young women around Honduras. And so we want to highlight um, that while it can be hard to to think about and to consider some of the impacts of those things, there's also hope. Um, And a lot of that hope is being seen not just in LMI, but also in other work that's happening around the, the country.